Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the head of the State Board of Education explains why the board is suing schools chief Diane Douglas. Also tonight, we'll get the latest news from Southern Arizona and we'll check out an extremely fuel efficient car. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio took the witness stand again today in his contempt of court hearing. Plaintiff's attorneys played video clips and used depositions and previous testimony to try to use Arpaio's own words against him, specifically his defiance of a court-appointed monitor overseeing his office. A subdued Arpaio also tried to shift blame to his subordinates when asked about his office disobeying a court order to stop enforcing federal immigration laws. The State Board of Education has sued the Superintendent of Public Instruction over access to a website used in teacher investigations. The board also wants the Education Department to redirect traffic to a new website, something the department has refused to do. Greg Miller is the president of the State Board of Education and he joins us now. Good to have you here. Thank you, Tim. Uh, why are you suing Diane? Douglas? <laughs> well, <clears throat> because um, Ms. Douglas continues to uh, be an obstruction to the um, ongoing work of the State Board staff. And we, so, men we mentioned teach access to this teacher misconduct information. Yes. Uh, her office says that the work that you're doing is technically illegal because it's outside of her control. Well, she's wrong. And she, she, um, she she basically went to court to try and prove that, and uh, Judge Starr threw the case out, telling her that she didn't have that authority. And so her initial uh, response when she did, did it was, we just need clarification from the court. I don't know what, you know, this, it's, you know, well, she got the clarification, but it wasn't what she wanted. And therefore, she's continuing that process. She's filed an appeal, and we'll see where how that goes. So w we have asked her on multiple times. We in in March and in July, um, and uh, officially in those times, and multiple times just on a on a routine working basis to provide uh, that access to the uh, certified database uh, for the people who had access to it before we moved. And basically, she's not letting that happen. And so the information, we can get it by going or people can go to the department's building um, and then they only, they're escorted and they have a, a shadow with them the entire time they're there. Um, they can't even get up and go to the restroom without the shadow. Um, and basically uh, that, is, that process is slowing down that review and that, the need for that kind of information. Um, for instance, just this last meeting, we basically pulled the certification of a convicted uh, pedophile. So um, those are the kinds of things that aren't, aren't working too terribly well. On the actual web page, uh, our web page as the State Board of Ed was housed within the uh, uh, department's overall web page. And when we moved, we set up a new one. And actually, the the IT department at, a, at a, uh, ADE did provide the transfer, and, and then a week later, she turned it off and has left the old page there. And again, she's saying that the work is illegally outside of her control. That's why she's not cooperating. Well, she, she's absolutely wrong, and she's already tried to make that uh, argument, and uh, the case was thrown out. The, uh, regarding this, this teacher misconduct information, which seems like a pretty important function Very here important. that should not be hindered or compromised or messed around with, um, she's also mentioning that remote access, which is what you're doing mm -hmm. or what you're you know, asking for. Yes, asking for. Um, but that could compromise information. Well, I, I would point out that that's almost a laughable joke. And the reason that it's almost laughable is, is that, first of all, there are, there, are, there are several ADE sites around the state that have remote access uh, to all digital information. And virtually every LEA, the local education agency, which are the districts and the charter entities, have access to that same, same databases with, with screens and, and protections in it. You can't all go everywhere. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But we all we all have it. So that's just a to me. That's just a. That's just the fly in the ointment. That's not true. And as far as moving, a lot of this seems to be based in moving out of the Department of Education mm -hmm. building and, and into the Executive Tower. Right. Okay, was that move necessary? Well, I think so. Um, three or four reasons. The first one was is that the the two senior people in the office were terminated without any advance notice to anybody. They were handed boxes and told to put their personal things in it and escorted by a DPS officer to their car. Um, it took over a week or two uh, to get them back in there. I don't remember now the exact timeline, but it, to get them back into their offices. Well, we had, we had people, senior people in, on her staff that were um, harassing our, maybe that's a harsh word, um, inconveniencing our staff. Uh, how, how were they Well, one filed an HR complaint about one of the employees, uh, uh, quote, sound familiar? Attacking her. Um, and another senior member of her staff would come and walk into their workspace and just hang around and not talk to anybody, not do anything, not ask any questions, just be around. And then there, it became pretty uh, a concern about whether um, private conversations or protected conversations were being monitored. And that was the last straw. It, at that moment in time, nothing you're not going to be able to work in that kind of an environment and get the things that we needed to get done. So the board decided to move into the tower. And now you want remote access? She says no. Now you want website information uh, mm -hmm. redirected over to your uh, new Correct. website? She says no. Um, so you filed suit. Yes. Now her suit, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. a judge kind of said, I, I have no dealing with this. This is political. Why is your suit not political? Well, the difference, uh, the difference there is, is the definition of the um, um, roles or the actions. Um, her suit was basically saying that she had full control over our staff. She does not. There's an AG's opinion back in the late 80s. Uh, this has uh, uh, been gone through by um, several different iterations. I can remember a, another superintendent who was concerned about this issue and was an attorney himself and uh, fairly familiar with the AG's office and he came back and said no uh, the board is in control of the board's employees so um, the when you look at what we're doing we're talking about the fact that she's not complying with the statutory requirements of her office which is to provide the, the way we are set up the state board is the is the policy maker the department of ed is the implementer mm -hmm. the superintendent is to ensure that the policies get implemented she has a unique role or the super the superintendent whether they're male or female has a unique role in the fact that they get to participate in the decision making for the policy but it's a group decision it is but again i think some folks would still say yes but this, the suits are similar enough to where if you're going to say one is political, even though it was dealt with delineation of duty, mm -hmm. uh, the other deals with the same thing and maybe a little bit uh, on a different avenue, but it's the same kind of ballpark here. Well, the, if you go back to the, the uh, Judge Starr's uh, initial ruling, she basically um, uh, made it fairly clear that, the, that several of the issues weren't uh, political and that uh, define the fact that the superintendent didn't have those authorities. And so uh, some of the other issues over uh, and that the superintendent was to enforce board policy, right? Mm -hmm. Well, these are policies that we've put into place um, and voted on to ensure that our staff can do the job that we're constitutionally required to do. So it sounds like the bottom line is here, there's just a conflict as whether or not board employees work for Diane Douglas. That's at the heart of all of this, isn't I it? I believe that's probably one of the majors. Did you grab Diane Douglas's arm during <laughs> a board meeting? No, I did not. What, what happened? <laughs> well, um, I, went, I actually went back and watched the tape myself. Um, but uh, what had happened was is that we were discussing uh, one of the items on the agenda that she wasn't terribly happy about at all. and. Um, I offered everybody the opportunity to speak. Several members did, including the superintendent. And then I asked again if there was anyone else who wanted to talk. And then they, no, one's, no one wanted any more mic time. So I said, this, the president's going to take 
some board, some table time, some talk time. And I started, and I basically told her that I felt like she was uh, in non-compliance of her of her jobs in supporting the uh, the supportive role that the superintendent has for the board. And she just started going off. Um, point of order, point of order, point of order. And I turned to her and I said, yeah. you know, you've had your opportunity. I'm not going to yield the floor to you again. And she still didn't stop, so I reached up and moved her microphone. And that's, that's what happened. And that's a result in an assault uh, that's what she claim did. She and a DPS investigation. Hated. Right. Um, she's, uh, we've only got about a minute left. She says you can't control your temper at any disagreement, uh, that the, the agenda items include never, never discussed for inclusion, and you have no purpose but to incite conflict and create billable hours for your attorneys. Oh, I read that too. I read that as well. Now, first of all, <laughs> just in general, again, we're kind of running out of time here. Do you think that maybe if she has that impression, could you have handled all this a little better? Well, one always looks back with 2020 rather than when you're there and sure maybe it could have been handled a little better but when you've gone when you have tried to get um, along and you've tried to be accommodating you've provided lots of different opportunities you've been sued un unjustly and had it thrown out of court you you've been um, degraded in some ways in in public uh, debate um, it's very difficult at that moment in time to say that mm, you could have handled it a little better. Sure, I didn't lose my temper. I just told her that she wasn't going to get the floor, and I never touched her. Can this so, be resolved, do you think? I think it can, and the, and the way it can be resolved is the legislature can go back and review what they, what they dropped at the end of session last session, which was a cleaning up of that un, um, undefined overlap between the Constitution and, and state law, and in fact in a couple of state laws that even are in conflict, and fix that. And if they would do that, then the lines would be clear. All right, we gotta stop right there. Thank you so much for joining us, we appreciate it. All right, thank you. Time again for Southern Exposure, our monthly look at stories and issues from the Tucson area and other points south. Joining us now is Tucson Weekly writer Jim Ninsel. Good to see you again. Thanks for being here. Good to get up here, see what it's like ahead of the uh, big Colexico show on Sunday. So <laughs> a little right. advanced work on that's the behalf right. of the band. Well, good luck getting tickets. It's sold out. That's what I hear. Yeah. I got my tickets, Ted. Great band. I'm ready. Um, U of A student, we've talked about this on the show, U of A student, uh, I think he's at Georgia Tech now, uh, just helped discover water on Mars and equipment at the U of A assisted. Water on Mars. Water on Mars, maybe life on Mars. That's what NASA, they follow in the water trying to find the life. This is uh, the result of about four years of studies that they've been doing. The U of A has a camera in orbit around Mars called the High Rise camera. It's aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, it's been up there since 2006. And they started knowing these, uh, noticing these odd streaks on some of the uh, hills and gullies as they flew overhead. And so they started monitoring them over a four year period and they, they would grow and shrink. And when, when things got warmer up there, they would grow and then as it cooled, they would shrink. And uh, they started wondering, is this possibly liquid water flowing on Mars that is making these, uh, these impressions? And uh, sure enough, uh, they did some other uh, experiments with, with another device on it that measures uh, mineral content. And it sure looks like it's salty, briny water that's uh, underneath the surface is what they're assuming and, and rising to the top and, and kind of flowing down hills. So. Seasonal water there. And again, like the point of origin, they're really not sure about the point. They think of aquifer maybe, but you never know. Exactly. 
I mean, and they're, they're, they're not sure where it's coming from, but I'm sure that's, that's going to be the next step to try to track that down because following the water, you yes, you get yes. to the light. Uh, how much civic pride in, in the U of A space endeavors down there in Tucson? Tremendous. I mean, the U of A has been part of the space program really right from the start. Uh, they, they managed the Phoenix Mars mission a few years back that dropped a probe right onto the, uh, the Arctic plains of Mars. And uh, they're working on another one that's going to go out asteroid hunting here. Uh, it's launching in just about a year from uh, now. They were in the midst of the one-year launch window now. So uh, putting together something called the OSIRIS-REx. So yes. a lot of excitement. Billion dollar contract. For the uh, we talked about civic pride. Is there much civic interest in the upcoming city council? I know that the mayor's race is a, a foregone conclusion. City council races, what's going on down there? It's uh, tough to get noticed if you're uh, running in these off-year elections to begin with. And uh, we have three council members up for election. It's a citywide election. So everybody gets to vote for all the candidates. Democrats, uh, you got about 93,000 Democrats Democrats and, and 53,000 Republicans in mm -hmm. Tucson, about 70,000 independents. So Democrats have a huge voter registration advantage. Republican candidates uh, are running against them. They've, they've raised about 12 grand each, which doesn't give you a whole lot of money to get your message out. So they, they're definitely facing an uphill battle. One Democrat has been unseated on the Tucson City Council in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. My goodness. So it's, it's very tough. They win an open seat now and then, but it's very tough for them to knock out a incumbent. Are Tucson residents generally happy with their city council? I think there's a split. You know, there are people who are very unhappy with the council and there are people who are, are happy with the council. And, and I think what you have going on is uh, the, the city has made some real progress in revitalizing the downtown area. They've made some progress in paving some of our roads, but there's a lot of roads left mm -hmm. to pave, and, and it's hard to turn people's perceptions around on something like that. So uh, there are a lot of challenges, certainly for our city. It's got about a 1,000 fewer employees than it used to have as a result of the economic uh, slowdown that we've experienced. And, and so, uh, you know, there, there are certainly fans of the city council and detractors. It's, yes. It's a tale of two cities if you listen to these candidates. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the, the mood is a little brighter now that the bus strike has ended after what, 40 some odd days? 42 days of uh, bus strike, a very drawn out experience down there. And uh, finally, uh, we're able to reach some kind of accommodation to give the drivers a raise. But that has opened up a whole new can of worms because now the police say they need a raise if they're going to give the bus drivers a raise. So, so are there winners and losers in this dispute? Well, the losers are probably the taxpayer. At the end of the day, uh, the, the council spends about $30 million out of its general fund to subsidize the bus program. And uh, so uh, they're, they're going to have to either raise fares or find efficiencies or, or find another way to make up for the additional money that the uh, bus drivers and mechanics are going to be getting as a result of this contract. But that's next year's budget challenge. Uh, we can't let you go without the Martha McSally. Apparently, the, 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 defunding Planned Parenthood. She's kind of got that figured out and yet shutting down the government. She's on the other side. What's going on here? Well, you, uh, there are a group of Republicans in the House who definitely would want to shut down government to force a confrontation over uh, defunding Planned Parenthood. Martha McSally wrote a letter last week, uh, our freshman congressman down there said that uh, she, she didn't support shutting down government over this. She has voted to defund Planned Parenthood with her fellow House members uh, last week. She voted again this week to uh, allow the states to shut off funding for Planned Parenthood. So she's not a big supporter supporter of Planned Parenthood, but she thought uh, shutting down government over it was the wrong way to go. I would imagine shutting down government would be a bad thing to run on. What, in, in that area, in southern Arizona, the Tucson district, but in other areas as well. It's a very split district. It is. One third Republican, one third Democrat, one third independent. So defunding Planned Parenthood, is that something you run on? Well, I, I, we'll, I'm sure it's something her opponents will be hitting her on when she runs for re-election next year. And uh, there was a poll out recently that showed uh, that voters there by a narrow margin would prefer a Democrat in that seat. But the two Democrats who are so far in the race were trailing uh, Martha specifically. So she's got a good reputation. Definitely. Before you go, I've got about 30 seconds left here. Tucson Modernism Week. I mean, historic preservation. Into, we know with a lot of fighting about that in Phoenix area. It, is historic preservation big in Tucson? Very big in Tucson. The, a lot of wonderful historic neighborhoods. And they're celebrating uh, modernism, which is the period after World War II, the old madman 
period. Yes. Mid-century uh, modern. Yeah, yes. mid-century modern, and they've got some great stuff going on in Tucson this weekend with uh, a vintage trailer show. They've got the Firebird 3, the, the uh, car of the future, the only one ever made. A uh, beautiful car with great fins uh, on display at our Museum of Contemporary Art, and uh, a whole bunch of talks, lectures, tours, and such things. So it's not Palm Springs, but you can find some good mid-century art, uh, mid-century uh, modern homes down there. They're trying to duplicate the success of uh, Palm Springs with their Modernism Week, and uh, we're a few years behind them at this point. Jim, good to see you again. Thanks oh, for joining us. Always a pleasure. Tonight's edition of Arizona Technology and Innovation looks at a fuel-efficient car, and we're not talking about a Prius or a Tesla here. We're talking about a car made by an Arizona man who's looking to make his mark in the auto industry. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Langston Field introduce us to the Elio. And we're in the process of creating uh, what we're calling... Paul Elio is not a typical car maker, and the Elio is not a typical car. The Elio is a new concept in transportation. The first thing you notice about the Elio is its unusual design, which includes three wheels instead of four. And the differences don't stop there. Inside, the two seats are in a straight line instead of side by side. The experience of the Elio, it feels like any other car you've been in because, you know, from the center line of your chest to the door, it's about an inch further than most cars. So it's a little bit roomier than, than your average car. So with the rear seat folded up, you can fit an airline compliant bag, you know, fits in the overhead bin. And with the rear seat folded down, you can fit golf clubs or other long items in it. We're gonna build it with seven colors. They all come with air conditioning, power windows, power door locks, and stereo. And despite its smaller size and unusual design, Elio says his car has met all national safety standards. It's a full-size vehicle, so we have ample crush zones front and back. It's designed with a full roll cage, uh, three airbags, two seat belts. It, it'll be a very safe vehicle. While the car's design might be considered out of the box, there's no new technology involved, and Elio says that will be the key to its success. Because as a pre-revenue startup, if, even if you bet on the right technology and it takes you six or nine months longer to work out than you thought, bad things happen. Right? So by using all known technology from people who are already making it, we uh, up our chances of success. Um, how we achieve this is just through innovative packaging and design. Another innovation Elio is proud of, getting 84 miles to the gallon. A recent study found the average fuel efficiency of a U.S. vehicle has improved only three miles per gallon since the days of the Ford Model T. Adding to that, there are 90 million cars on the road that only get 20 miles to the gallon. After five years of sales, we can reduce total U.S. gas consumption by nearly a half a percent. That's a meaningful number. And whether your biggest uh, concern is the trade deficit due to foreign oil or global warming due to carbon emissions, the answer is the same. Use less oil. We need to use less oil, and Elio can really accomplish that in a meaningful way. With a $6,400 price tag, Elio says his car becomes affordable for an entire economic section of this country. But if you're struggling in this country, your biggest issue is mobility. There is a Harvard economist that did a study, and the biggest single correlator on whether you get out of poverty or not is mobility. It correlates better than crime rate in your community. Elio is an engineer by trade and has worked for car companies in the past. Ever since he was a little boy, though, he's dreamed of designing his own car. And now that he's on the verge of that coming true, 
He says this reality is even better than he could have imagined. Dream big. Don't be afraid to fail. You know, I mean, like, like we talked about earlier, there's been a lot of no's on this road. There's been a lot of hard days. Um, but, but you just keep trying. The cars will be made in Shreveport, Louisiana. Elio Motors is currently taking reservations for the vehicle on its website, with the first Elio expected to roll off the assembly line by late next year. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. ASU's Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering strive to advance research, education, and industry to transform our economy. Ideas, talent, and technology for Arizona. You can learn more at engineering.asu.edu/tv.